IP as contract, the limits of contract. The law then should protect individuals' rights to one's body and to legitimately acquired scarce resources, property. There is not a natural right to ideal objects, to one's in intellectual innovations or creations, but only to scarce resources. Many opponents of IP rights typically support only contractual arrangements to protect ideas and innovations, private contracts between property owners. Suppose, for example, that A writes a book and sells physical copies of it to numerous purchasers, B1, B2, to BN, with a contractual condition that each buyer, B, is obligated to not make or sell a copy of the text. Under all theories of contract, any of the buyers, B, become liable to A, at least for damages, if he violates these provisions. But the advocates of contractual approach to IP are mistaken if they believe that private contract can be used to uh, recreate the same type of protection afforded by modern IP rights. Patent and copyright are good against all third parties, regardless of their consent to a contract. They are real rights that bind everyone in the same way that my title to a parcel of land binds everyone to respect my property, even if they do not have a contract with me. A contract, by contrast, binds only parties to the contract. It is like private law between the parties. It does not bind third parties, i.e. those not in privity with the original parties. Thus, if the book purchaser B relates to third parties T, the plot of the purchase novel, these third parties T are not bound in general by the original contractual obligation between A and B. If I learn how to adjust my car's carburetor to double its efficiency, or if I learn of a poem or a movie plot someone else has written, why should I have to pretend that I am ignorant of these things and refrain from acting on this knowledge? I have not obligated myself by contract to the creator. I do not deny the contractual obligations can be implicit or tacit, but there's not even an implicit contract in such situations. Nor can it be said as a general matter that I have stolen or fraudulently acquired the information, as there are many legitimate ways for individuals to acquire prop or information. Artistic works, by their very nature, typically are made public. Scientific discoveries and innovations, likewise, can become known beyond the parties to confidentiality agreements. And it certainly cannot be said that my use of my carburetor or writing a novel using the same plot physically interferes with the creator's use of his own tangible property. It does not even prevent the creator from using his own carburetor idea to improve his own car or others, or from using that plot. So, my adjusting my carburetor is not a breach of contract, it is not theft, and it is not physical trespass on the inventor's tangible property. Twiddling my carburetor does not violate the inventor's rights. At most, my use of this idea will diminish its value to the inventor by hampering his ability to monopolistically exploit it. As we have seen, however, one cannot have a right to the value of one's property, but only in its physical integrity. Thus, the use of contract only gets us so far. A book publisher may be able to contractually obligate his pur purchasers to not copy his book, but he cannot prevent third parties from publishing and selling it unless some contract prohibits this action. Contract versus Reserved Rights Third parties, then, who are not parties to the contract and are not in privity with the contractual ob obligor and obligee are not bound by the contractual relationship. For this reason, although an innovator can use contract to stop specified individuals from freely using his ideas, it is difficult to use standard contract law to prevent third parties from using ideas they glean from others. Perhaps sensing this problem, some quasi-IP advocates shift from purely contractual approach to a reservation of rights approach, in which property rights and tangible resources are seen as divisible bundle of rights. For example, under the standard bundle of rights view, a landowner can sell the mineral estate to an oil company while retaining all rights to the surface, except for an easement, servitude, granting passage to a neighbor and a life estate, usufruct, granting use of the surfa uh, surface estate to his own mother. Drawing on the bundle of rights notion, the reservation of rights approach holds that a type of private IP can be privately generated by creatively reserving rights to reproduce tangible items sold to purchasers. Rothbard, for example, argues that one can grant conditional ownership of knowledge to another while retaining the ownership power to disseminate the knowledge of the invention. Or Brown, the inventor of an improved mousetrap, can stamp it copyright and thereby sell the right to each 
mousetrap except for the right to reproduce it. Like the real rights accompanying statutory IP, such reservations allegedly bind everyone, not just those who have contracted with the original seller. Thus, third parties who become aware of, uh, of purchase or otherwise come into possession of the restricted item also cannot reproduce it, not because they have entered into a contract with Brown, but because, quote, no one can acquire a greater property title than something that has already been given away or sold, end quote. In other words, the third party acquires a tangible thing, a book or a mousetrap, say, but it is somehow missing the right to copy part of the bundle of rights that normally constitutes all rights to the thing, or the third party acquires ownership of information from a person who did not own the information and thus was not entitled to transmit it to others. But surely something is amiss here. Suppose that A writes a novel and sells a copy book one without restriction, i.e. without a reservation of rights, to B1, and a second book, book two, to B2, but reserving the book's inherent right to copy. The two books, book one and book two, appear to third parties to be otherwise identical. Yet they are not. One is incomplete, and the other somehow contains more mystical rights essence within its covers. Suppose B1 and B2 leaves these books on a park bench, where they are discovered by third party T. According to Rothbard, book 2 is missing the right to copy, much like an electronic toy that is sold, batteries not included. It is as if there is an invisible mystical tendril of, rat, of reproduction ownership stretching from book 2 back to its owner, A, wherever he may be. Thus, even if T finds and homesteads the abandoned book 2, this book simply does not contain within itself the right to permit the owner to copy it. It is being continue, continually siphoned away by a rights wormhole which connects the item to owner A. Thus, if T homesteads the book. He still homesteads no more than he acquires T. Uh, than he acquires T homesteads only a book without a right to copy built in, and thus does not have a right to copy book two. The same is true for subsequent third parties who come to possess the book. Is such a view really tenable? Can we conceive of property rights working in this way? Even if we can, would it really achieve the desired result here, preventing third parties from using the protected ideas? It is difficult to maintain that rights can be reserved in this manner. One function of property rights, after all, is to prevent conflict and to put third parties on notice as to the property's boundaries. The borders of property must necessarily be objective and intersubjectively ascertainable. They must be visible. Only if borders are visible can they be respected and property rights serve their function of permitting conflict avoidance. Only if these borders are visible and objectively just, justifiable in discourse, can they be expected to be adopted and followed. But think of the two books, book one and book two. How could one tell the difference between them? How could one see the rights tendril connected to the latter but not to the former? How can third parties be expected to respect an amorphous, invisible, mystical, spooky, possibly unknown and unknowable property border? The implications for such a view are troubling. Palmer writes, quote, The separation and retention of the right to copy from the bundle of rights that we call property is problematic. Could one reserve that right, for example, to remember something? Suppose that I wrote a book and I offered it to you to read it, but I had retained one right, the right to remember it. Would I be justified in taking you to court if I could prove that you had remembered the name of the lead character in the book? End quote. But... Third parties still pose a problem for this theory. Even if a seller of an object could somehow reserve certain rights with respect to the sold object, how does one prevent third parties from using information apparent from or conveyed in that object? Reserved rights proponents say more than that the uh, say more than that the immediate buyer B1 is bound not to reproduce the book for this result could be obtained by pointing to the implicit contract between seller A and B and buyer B1. Let us consider a third party T1 who finds and reads the abandoned book, thus learning the information in it. Alternatively, consider a third party T2 who never had possession of or even sees the book. He merely learns of the information in the book from either gossip, graffiti, unsolicited email, and so forth. Neither T1 nor T2 has a contract with A, but both now possess certain knowledge. Even if the book somehow does not contain within it a right to reproduce, how does this prevent T1 and T2 from using their own knowledge? Even if we say that T1 is somehow bound by a contractual copyright notice printed on the book and until 
untenable view of contract, how is T1 bound by any contract or reserved right? Rothbard attempts to address this point as follows, quote, A common objection runs as follows, All right, it would be criminal for Green, the buyer, to produce and sell the Brown mousetrap, but suppose that someone else, Black, who had not made a contract with Brown, happens to see Green's mousetrap, and then he goes ahead and produces and sells the replica. Why would he be prosecuted? The answer is that no one can acquire a greater property title in something than has already been given away or sold. Green did not own the total property right in his mousetrap in accordance with this con with his contract with Brown, but only all rights except to sell a replica. But therefore, Black's title in the mousetrap, the ownership of the ideas in Black's head, can be no greater than Green's, and therefore he too would be a violator of Brown's property even though he himself had not made the actual contract." End quote. There are several problems with this reasoning. First of all, Black merely sees Green's mousetrap. He does not see or have access to ideas in Green's head, nor does he need to have such access in order to duplicate evident features of the mousetrap. Further, ideas in one's head are not owned any more than labor is owned. Only scarce resources are owned. By losing sight of scarcity as a necessary aspect of a homesteadable thing and of first occupancy homesteading rule as the way to own such things, Rothbard and others are sidetracked into the mistaken notion that ideas and labor can be owned. If we recognize that ideas cannot be owned, they are not scarce resources, that creation is neither necessary nor sufficient for ownership, first occupancy is, and that labor need not be owned in order to be a homesteader, then the trouble caused by these confused notions disappear. If Black somehow comes into possession of the ideas implicit in an item which Brown invented, in Rothbard's example, he happens to see it. It is irrelevant that the mousetrap may not have had a right to copy built into it, for Black does not need such permission to use his own property as he sees fit. How does happening to see the mousetrap make Black a trespasser or violator of Brown's rights? All action, including action which employs own scarce resources, uh, property, involves the use of technical knowledge. Some of this knowledge may be gained from things we see, including the property of others. We do not have to have a right to copy as a part of a bundle of rights to have a right to impose a known pattern or form on an object we own. Rather, we have a right to do anything at all with and on our own property, provided only that we do not invade others' property borders. We must not lose sight of this crucial libertarian point. If I own 100 acres of land, I can prance around naked on it, not because the land is imbued with some right to prance naked, but because I own the land and it does not necessarily violate the property rights of others for me to use my property in this fashion. Similarly, I am entitled to what uh, to do what I want with my own property, my car, my paper, my word processor, including improving my car's carburetor or using my ink to print words on my paper. That is, unless I have contractually obligated myself to someone else to restrict my actions with respect to my use of this knowledge, I do not have to first find in my property a right to use in a certain way for all ways of using it, except those that cause invasions of others' property borders are already encompassed within the, very, within the general right to use my property. In libertarianism, we live by right, not by permission. We do not need to find permission to take our actions with our own property. Contrary to practice in totalitarian societies, all things that are not forbidden are permitted. The reservation of rights view could would reverse this by assuming that every use of property is valid only if that particular use right can be somehow found or located in the property. Consider the following analogy. Farmer Jed discovers oil under his land. No one for miles around knows about the black gold. Jed plans to buy his neighbor's property for a song. They'll sell it cheap, too, since they don't know about the oil. In the middle of the night, his nosy neighbor, Cooter, suspicious over Jed's recent good spirits, sneaks onto Jed's land and discovers the truth. The next morning at Floyd's barbershop, Cooter spills his guts to Clem and the boys. One of them prompt, uh, promptly runs to a payphone and gives a tip to a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, who happened to be his nephew. Soon, it is common knowledge that there is oil in the vicinity. The neighbors now demand exorbitant prices for the land, thus spoiling Jed's plan. Let us grant that Cooter can now be prosecuted for trespass and harms flowing therefrom. The question is, can Jed's neighbors be prevented from acting on their knowledge? That is, 
May they be forced to somehow pretend that they do not know about the oil and sell their land to Jet for what they would have sold it when in ignorance. Of course they may not be so forced. They own their land and are entitled to use it as they see fit. Unlike tangible property, information is not ownable. It is not property. The possessor of a stolen watch may have to return it, but so long as the acquirer of the knowledge does not obtain the knowledge illicitly or in violation of a contract, he is free to act upon it. Note, however, that according to the Reservation of Rights view, the neighbors would not be permitted to act upon their knowledge because they obtained it ultimately from Cooter, a trespasser who had no tie, uh, title to that knowledge. Thus, they could not have obtained greater title to it than Cooter himself had. Note also that others, such as geological surveyors mapping oil deposits, cannot include this information in their maps. They must feign ignorance unless given permission by Jed. This imposed ignorance correlates with the unnatural scarcity imposed by IP. There is clearly no warrant for the view that reserved rights can somehow prohibit third parties from using the knowledge they acquire. It is simply not legitimate to restrict the use to which an owner of property can put it unless the owner has contractually obligated himself or has otherwise acquired the information by a violation of the information holder's rights. Talk of reserving the right to copy is merely a way to avoid contractual the contractual notion that only parties to a contract are bound by it. Therefore, as a general matter, purchasers can be bound by contracts with sellers to not copy or even resell the thing. However, once third parties become aware of the ideas underlying the invention or literary work, their use of that knowledge does not, in general, violate any recognizable property rights of the seller. Given this view of scarcity, property, and contract, let us examine the legitimacy of common forms of IP. Copyright and Patent As should be apparent, copyright and patents seek to prevent the owners of tangible property, scarce resources, from using their own property as they see fit. For example, they are prohibited under patent law from practicing patented methods, using their own property, or from shaping their own property into patented devices, even if they independently invent the method or device. Under the copyright law, third parties who have not contracted with the author are prevented from copying and profiting from the author's original work. Clearly, sellers of no novel devices or literary works can contract with buyers to prevent these buyers from reproducing or even reselling the item. These contractual webs can be elaborate. A novel writer can license his story to a movie studio on the condition that the studio require all movie theaters to require customers to agree not to reproduce the plot of the movie and so on. Yet once third parties, uh, once third parties not bound by a contract acquire this information, they are free to use it as they see fit. The reserved rights approach does not change this. Thus, it would probably be difficult to maintain anything similar to our present copy patent and copyright laws using contract alone. Trade secrets. Trade secrets are easier to justify than patent or copyright. Palmer argues that they emerge from common law type rights and are thus legitimate. Trade secret law allows damages to be obtained for or an injunction to be issued to prevent acts of misappropriations of a trade secret. This can be applied against the person who has improperly acquired the trade secret who divulges the secret contrary to a contractual obligation and also against others who know that they are obtaining the secret from such a person. Suppose employee A of company X has access to X's trade secrets such as its secret formula for soft drink. He is subject to an employee agreement or employment agreement obligating him to keep this secret or uh, form or formula secret. He then jumps to X's competitor Y. Y wants to use the formula it learns from A to compete with X. Under current law, so long as the secret formula has not been made public, X can get a court order to stop A from revealing the secret to Y. If A had, uh, has already revealed the secret to Y, X can also get an injunction to stop Y from using or publicizing the formula. Clearly, the injunction and damages against A are, pro are proper because A is in violation of its contract with X. More questionable is the injunction against Y, because Y had no contract with X. In the context in which such situations usually arise, however, where the competitor Y wants the trade secret and knows that 
the knows the defecting employee is in breach of contract, it could be argued that the competitor Y is acting in conspiracy with or as an accomplice of employee A to violate the contractual rights of trade secret holder X. This is because A has not actually breached his trade secrecy agreement until he reveals the trade secrets to Y. If Y actively solicits A to do this, then Y is an accomplice or co-conspirator in the violation of X's rights. Thus, just as the driver of the getaway car in a bank robbery or the mafia boss who orders an assassination are properly held liable for acts of aggression committed by others with whom they conspire, third parties can, in narrowly defined cases, be prevented from using a trade secret obtained from the trade secret thief. Trademarks Palmer also argues that trademark law, trademark law is legitimate. Suppose that Lockmanian changes the name of his filling hamburger chain from Lockman Burgers to Rothbard Burgers, which is already the name of another chain. I, as a consumer, am hungry for a Rothbard Burger. I see one of the fake Roth, uh, Rothbard Burgers uh, joints run by the stealthy Lockmanian, and I buy a burger. Under current law, Rothbard, the owner of the Rothbard Burgers trademark, can prevent the Lockmanian from Manian, uh, from using the mark Rothbard Burgers to sell burgers because it is confusingly similar to his own trademark. That is, it is you. It is likely to mislead consumers as to the true source of the goods purchased. The law then gives a right to the trademark holder against the trademark infringer. In my view, it is the consumers whose rights are violated, not the trademark holders. In the foregoing example, I, the consumer, thought I was buying a Rothbard burger, and, but instead got a crummy Lockman burger with its weird kaleidoscopic sauce. I should have a right to sue the Lockmanian for fraud and breach of contract, not to mention in, uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress and misrepresentation of praxeological truths. However, it is difficult to see how this act of fraud perpetrated by the Lockmanian on me violates Rothbard's rights. The Lockmanian's actions do not physically invade Rothbard's property. He does not even convince others to do this. At most, he may be said to convince third parties to take an action within the rights, namely to buy a burger from the Lockmanian instead of Rothbard. Thus, it would appear that under libertarianism, trademark law should, be, should give consumers, not trademark users, the right to sue trademark pirates. Moreover, more novel extensions of trademarks, such as rights against trademark dilution or against certain forms of cyber squatting, cannot be justified. Just as a trademark holder does not have a right to his mark, neither does he have a right against his mark's dilution. The law against cyber squatting is also si uh, simply based on an economically ignorant opposition to scalping and arbitrage. There is, of course, nothing wrong with being the first to acquire a domain name and thereafter selling it to the highest bidder. Conclusion we see, then, that a system of property rights in ideal objects necessarily requires violation of other individual property rights, e.g., to use one's own tangible property as one sees fit. Such a system requires a new homesteading rule which subverts the first occupier rule. IP, at least in the form of patent and copyright, cannot be justified. It is not surprising that IP attorneys, artists, and inventors often seem to take for granted the legitimacy of IP. However, those more concerned with liberty, truth, and rights should not take for granted the institutionalized use of force used to enforce IP rights. Instead, we should reassert the primacy of individual rights over our bodies and homesteaded scarce resources.